other um, situations, but not here formally. So, um, for those of you I may not have met formally, I'm Maria Jones, I'm the director of the PT program, and I think this is my first time lecturing for um, you guys to get this. Oh, I thought you had. I no, no, you. that's what, that's what they, they said they knew you. So well, they do, because I've been a good shepherd, and we oh, pass in the hallway right. on bathroom breaks. <laughs> <laughs> they know Bob, he, you know, that's really, What's important? <laughs> Finally, someone. The no, office mate of uh... <laughs> Anyway, so um, I am here today in uh, my role as a physical therapist, and I will admit that this is not my area of expertise in terms of uh, physical therapy. I'm primarily a pediatric physical therapist, and um, we're working primarily with uh, children and adults with developmental disabilities, but deal with um, all sorts of patients and even. Um, those with developmental disabilities often have um, diabetes and um, consequences as a result of that. So um, I'll be talking to this and all of this information or the majority of it comes from um, this textbook. Some of it will be PT specific language and I'll point those out to you. It talks about practice patterns later on in the, um, which you guys might be wondering what that's about. Again, that's PT specific. Um, so you all don't need to know that, but it's just part of what was included is in the slides. So, uh, physical therapists do play a role um, primarily for individuals with diabetes as it relates to wound management, but we'll also talk about other um, treatments that we're involved in as we move forward. So um, those with diabetes um, often suffer neuro neuropathic ulcers, which are also not known as diabetic ulcer ulcerations. We have over 24 million Americans with diabetes and the incidence of those ulcerations varies between uh, 15 and 25 percent of those with diabetes end up with some sort of neuropathic ulcer ulceration. Um, it's also um, diabetes in terms of complications are responsible for over 600,000 amputations per year. 50 percent of those will um, have a contralateral, so um, ulceration within 18 months. So it's not atypical. You see, and we see it a lot in practice. I have a good friend of mine, Stephanie Burns, who's a physical therapist that worked at um, the VA and actually retired from that system. And she said she actually did her dissertation work on um, individuals with diabetes and multiple amputations because she said, regardless of education, it was like they just continued. They'd have one toe amputated, and then it'd be midfoot, and then it'd be the contralateral side, you know, midfoot amputation, then it'd go back to the other side, you know, below knee amputation, and yet. The risk factors were explained, the, the things that they needed to do, but yet there was still not this awareness of good glycemic control and kind of consequences as a result of that, which is what we will talk about. And then 50% uh, of those, again, will have a second ampu amputation within three to five years. So it's not uncommon, um, and our hope is that we can provide intervention early on so that we can prevent that first amputation because once they have an amputation, it just kind of seems to um, snowball from there. So in terms of why do we see um, these changes in um, individuals with diabetes, primarily because of high blood sugars, you have changes in the red blood cells, platelets and capillaries, which um, results in altered blood flow um, and also increases the microvascular pressure that you have. So they just do not have, and they have slow healing, um, and so it causes the glycinated uh, proteins cause tissue trauma. Um, and kind of an uh, over-exaggeration of tissue trauma, so um, you get an accumulation of sorbitol um, due to the breakdown of glucose, and again, that results in the tissue destruction that happens. Um, you, um, in combination with that, you have um, kind of tissue breakdown on in the nerves and all of that, and so it just it begins to snowball after a while, and um, you get consequences that are hard to deal with. So here are the risk factors um, that we know contribute to neuropathic ulcers and delayed healing. Um, there's a whole host of them which we'll go through individually and talk about each one and why it's important and kind of our, my role as a physical therapist that I play in both um, instruction and then other interventions that I can do. 
Um, and I think some of these things, obvious, you, you all as <laughs> PAs will be on the front line, usually seeing them before um, they are at the beginning stages, but you may want to refer to physical therapy for different looks at, uh, if you notice something, we'll talk about gait and the way that they walk. Um, you may want to refer to a physical therapist to have a more in-depth look at that and see if there's any interventions that we can provide um, to, again, prevent further loss and damage. So when we look at vascular disease, um, they are um, at risk for peripheral vascular disease and it's greater in individuals with diabetes than the general population. Um, they have accelerated rates of arteries of the arteries or atherosclerosis. And what we used to believe um, in terms of the vascular disease is thickening of the basement membrane was one of the major contributing factors to neuropathic ulcers, but what we now know is it's really the neuropathy. Um, that is the primary uh, response um, to neuro or the response to development of neuropathic ulcers. So when we look at causative factors of amputations in those with diabetes, you can see the biggest chunk, 82%, is because of neuropathy. Um, so you have about 5% that is uh, related to ischemia or lack of blood flow to the area, and then there's about 13% that's a whole host of other causes, but really it is the neuropathy. And so if we can get people to understand that good glycemic control um, can prevent the development of neuropathy before they get there, that's really the link that we need to try to draw to them. Because once they have neuropathy, then there's a whole host of other changes um, that begin to occur um, and ultimately will lead to. And I think sometimes we need to be more upfront to them, with them about this is ultimately where you're headed in terms of amputation if we don't deal with um, the symptoms up front. So in neuropathy, again, it is the most common complication of diabetes. Um, the causes is, um, again, you have ischemia to the nerves, um, and which results in segmental um, demyelinization. So basically the nerves just over time begin demyelinating and die. Um, and so you have loss of um, both sensory function, and that's usually the first that goes. So you have a loss of sensation to the area, but then you have subsequent loss of uh, motor function as well as autonomic systems. Um, the important part of this is it is typically, the neuropathy is typically, so when you're doing your physical exam, it's going to be symmetrical, um, and it usually starts distally. So that's why we do diabetic foot exams. Um, and it almost always starts in the feet, although sometimes you will see in the hands. Um, but again, um, it will be very seldom does it just happen on one side versus the other. In terms of uh, sensory neuropathy, again, 50% uh, of patients are unaware that they've lost protective extension, or pr protective extension, <laughs> protective sensation. And what is protective? I know you guys have just done some filament testing, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what is um, protective sensation? Temperature. Pain. Okay. Temperature. Okay, pain. feeling temperature. Pain. Pain. Okay, sharp. So. Give me an example of sometimes like a protective uh, sensation that you may feel that a person with diabetes may not feel. Tag. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I heard a tack. Okay, good. And what else? If you pour hot coffee on your foot. Okay, pour hot coffee, or again, probably a more common thing is <laughs> pour hot coffee, but bath water. Uh -huh. You know, you put your toe in, and you know, well, if you're you have diabetes, you don't feel those sorts of things. So. Same thing, if you've got a rock in your shoe, all those, you can feel a blister coming on, um, those sorts of things that you know, individuals don't have. Um, so again, that lack of protective sensation leads to lack of early detection to irritation or trauma, which um, you have, and I provided two handouts about foot care. Uh, one is just a one-page handout, and one's a more in-depth handout um, that are good resources for both you as PAs as well as uh, patients that you might be seeing. And it's important for them to do that and really understand that if they don't have that sensation, that's why it's important for them to visually um, inspect their feet on a regular basis. And whatever tools they need to do to um, visually inspect their feet is important. Now we're going to talk about here a little bit what's another common problem with individuals that have diabetes may hinder their ability to do foot checks. Obesity. Yeah. Okay, obesity. Uh-huh. What else? Retinopathy. Stiffness. 
Retinopathy. Retinopathy. So again, we talk about visually inspecting, but then if you've got a vision problem on top of that, even doing that day-to-day -day visual care uh, becomes problematic. So that's where we have to teach them other ways in which if they have decreased mobility using mirrors um, that they can use. But again, even a mirror, if it's too far away, um, again, depending on their visual deficits, they may have difficulty with that. So getting them to either routinely have other people check their feet if they have a supportive living arrangement. Um, those are things that depending on the number of comorbidities that they have that we may have to alter and really think about how is this going to work for that individual. Um, and again, paresthesias, if they're un unable to perceive the 10 grams of pressure, they're going to be at risk for ulceration. So you first, um, we oftentimes what I said is you both have sensory motor and um, autonomic within the sensory is what typically starts first and that's why we do the, the testing that we do. Um, but then you also will begin seeing um, motor neuropathy or motor changes um, and that results in intrinsic um, or muscle weakness and atrophy that occurs in their feet. Uh, which causes decreased foot stability, which leads to deformities, <laughs> and also le leads to increased pressure and shear, shear forces um, that happen on parts of the feet that normally aren't meant to be weight-bearing parts of the foot. Um, when we're dealing with um, autonomic neuropathy, what you often see is dry or cracked skin, um, basically due to their inability to uh, sweat. They often will have callus formation, and the tricky thing about callus formation is oftentimes the callus will actually cover an underlying neuropathic ulcer. Um, and so you have to watch for that, because sometimes it's the callus formation is removed, and that's when you notice that um, they have an underlying um, pressure sore that's developed. Um, you have um, basically arteriovenous shunting, which leads to decreased perfusion, and again relates to their uh, inability to or decreased ability to sweat. And then uncontrolled vasodilation um, can lead to osteopenia. Penia. So mechanical stresses that they have, you have abnormal or excessive forces that predispose to ulcerations, and again, the, those primarily occur. Um, in the lower extremities, especially in the foot, that's why there's so much attention paid to um, diabetic foot care. Um, because of those, you have high, um, and, and usually it's because of the lack of dorsiflexion or the ability to uh, pull your ankle or toes towards your um, shin. Um, you have a tendency to put more weight on your metatarsals and the soles of your feet. Um, and because of those high plantar um, pressures, it really overloads the tissue's ability to repair itself. And if you think about that, once they get uh, a pressure ulcer, really trying to keep weight off that foot when you have to be up and around becomes increasingly difficult. Um, abnormal foot function and inadequate footwear, um, as those of you, some, some of you have, I've interacted with, as part of um, Good Shepherd, and that's one of the things that, as a physical therapist, I will always look at is their footwear, <laughs> and there's reasons for that. Um, number one, it tells you a lot about where they're actually, you know, I'll sometimes take their, have them take their shoe off and just look at the sole of their foot um, or the sole of their shoe to see where the wear is. Is there more wear on the medial side of it? Is there more wear laterally? And where are they likely to most um, to be sustaining those high pressures? Um, then you can also look at their, the bottom of their foot in relation to what you found on the sole of the shoe to see does this make sense? Does the callus formation on the lateral border make sense given where their, you know, the shoe wear is? Um, and sometimes you'll see that they are consistent with one another. Um, sometimes you'll see a pattern that doesn't really make sense given and you can begin asking questions like are these your normal shoes that you wear and sometimes they'll say no this is my brother's shoes that I borrowed for the appointment or whatever it is so those are things that you just have to keep in mind but really to paying attention to um, footwear looking at um, major problems that we see in individuals that have um, diabetes uh, are great toe extension which you may not think is a big deal but as we go in and later on talk about the gait cycle, great toe extension is really necessary for propulsion or toe off, uh, which allows the foot to clear the ground um, to go through the swing phase of the gait cycle. They also have limitations in dorsiflexion. So again, you may hear an audible, you don't typically hear an audible foot slap, 
but I'll show you um, a, a video later of a neuropathic gait, um, which basically is an increased amount of knee flexion um, in the swing phase of gait, and that's because they can't adequately dorsiflex their foot, and so they actually increase knee and hip flexion to make sure their foot actually clears the ground. And as a result of that, they may you may hear kind of an audible slap. Um, you also see, see that sometimes in individuals that have other neurological challenges. And so, um, you know, sorting out is it a neurological problem versus um, something that's related to diabetes is always something that you need to look at. And then the subtalar joint um, also can, over time, um, and especially if they have existing deformities have um, decreased mobility within it, and so because of that, that's going to lead um, to more problems with dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. And again, um, again, you may see increased vertical pressure and horizontal shear um, based on the, the malalignment they have within their foot. Foot deformities that are common, um, again, plantar flexor contracture, so because of their lack of dorsiflexion, they will actually begin not to be able, and they'll be stuck in a, a position of plantar flexion, which when you, you do that, um, where is um, the weight bearing going, or where, is the, the, where are the forces primarily going to be on your foot? If you're in plantar flexion, which is this, okay, and you're stuck there, Where's my weight going to be? The falling foot. Okay. Which is? Your metatarsal head. <laughs> okay, good job. <laughs> so, um, the other thing that we see is varus and valgus. Uh, of the, it is primarily the calcaneus, okay, that goes from, um, during the different phases of the gait cycle is going to go from a position of valgus to one of, at mid-stance, we're typically in neutral uh, alignment in terms of the calcaneus, and then when we actually go to push off, we move to a position of varus. Okay, so valgus, if you, if I were to, <laughs> is where your calcaneus is rotated out just slightly, if you look at it in relation to the bottom part of my calf. Okay, so my calcaneus is going to be shifted. So here's my uh, calf, and my calcaneus is going to be shifted slightly um, laterally. Okay, so that's going to be valgus. So if, as you're looking at it, it's going to be a shape of an L. Uh, at mid stance, we're going to be primarily vertical, and then as we go to toe off, it's going to be a little bit of a bear's. Okay, so normally we go through those and shift back and forth. What happens with pe people, with uh, individuals with diabetes, is that doesn't happen. That varus valgus movement doesn't occur because they have limited ankle uh, range of motion. And um, the ultimate deformity that is um, highly common in individuals with diabetes is Charcot foot, which we will, you have a picture of. Um, in terms of um, other foot function, if they have prior ulceration, um, or amputation, obviously that is going to alter the mechanics of um, their gait. It's going to offer, you know, they'll, they'll offload, if you will. So they may develop some other gait deviations that occur because they're simply trying to keep weight off um, that portion of the foot. And that's still if they have good sensation. If they don't have good sensation and they don't, you know, even understand that they have a pressure ulcer, then they're going to continue to walk and um, put uh, forces on that part of the foot. And then again, poor footwear, either sandals, like I have on, <laughs> that do not provide, uh, protect the feet in any way, which is something we don't encourage people with um, diabetes to wear. Um, they may cause um, decreased pressure or shear, and again, needing something that um, accommodates um, the deformities to, to make sure that it's not causing um, additional problems. So this is a, actually, again, I mentioned Stephanie Burns who worked at the VA, and this is a picture, and you actually, this is you have a model here of what a Charcot deformity in terms of a pressure ulcer that can develop as a result of that. That's actually a little more significant than even this. So basically what you have is the head of the talus is now collapsing medially um, and onto the, the surface of the um, the foot. So they're weight bearing on their talus, which is not normally what happens. <laughs> Don't normally weight bear. Um, we typically have a medial arch um, that helps support. So as the 
we talk about the foot structures and we talk about the, the tissue damage that occurs um, and again the motor um, damage that occurs in the muscle, we have lack of basically motor control. So we can't maintain, uh, if you're an individual with diabetes, you don't maintain those natural arches in your foot, it begins to collapse over time, you lose less control and you end up with deformities that look a lot like that. So in terms of impaired healing and immune response, um, what you see, and actually Amanda can probably attest to this a little bit, uh, she has type 1 diabetes, not type 2, but she recently broke her um, little finger. I don't know if you've seen her walking around in her splint, um, but it was just kind of a freak accident. And even she experiences delayed healing. So they put it in a splint for two weeks, hoping that it would you know, have osteocyte formation and she wouldn't have to have um, anything done but when they went back it still was unstable and actually had displaced even more and so she ultimately ended up having to have surgery um, to fixate it and when they went in to have the surgery <laughs> the little piece of the um, phalange that they were trying to because it was just the distal phalanx is what it was that had broken a piece of it had broken off and when they tried to reinsert it to the and the tendon to the other part it basically shattered. So mm -hmm. they ended up having to put a rod in <laughs> that connected the distal phalanx to the middle phalanx, um, and she'll have to have that in for two weeks before you know anything else can happen. So it's just part of the process is delayed healing, um, and hopefully, and the ability to form even new tissue, including bone, um, is delayed in many ways. So. Uh, and because of that, you have a constant uh, fighting infection and making sure that infection doesn't form in those sites um, where you get it. You do, uh, or individuals with diabetes, have increased frequency of osteomyelitis. So again, the risk for bone infections to occur is, um, as well as soft tissue um, infections, is um, problematic. And I think the difficult thing is that it really impairs all phases of the womb cycle or womb healing. Um, it's not just one phase, it's all phases. And so it's a slow process um, that occurs both from the inflammatory phase on through the fibroblastic phase where you've got um, you know, new cells laying down and then the maturation phase where you get remodeling of the tissue and strengthening. And it, you know, as you, I'm sure you know, when once that happens, and we deal with this, this with individuals with spinal cord injuries as well, once you have a, you know, an open sore, that skin really never goes back to its full capacity. And so you're always at increased risk. Um, and that's why you know, um, pressure ulcers or neuropathic ulcers, once they open uh, and occur, they're one of the most expensive things that we can do in healthcare. Um, so that's why prevention is, is such a key. So we talked about this a little bit already, and that's uh, one of the other complicating factors that we have with individuals with diabetes is poor vision. Um, it is the leading cause of retinopathy, glaucoma, and cataracts that we see. Um, they also are at increased risk of trauma due to poor vision because they don't see things as well. Um, so they themselves can cause, it's kind of self-induced trauma <laughs> in some ways because they don't see things coming at them to, to be able to have those protective responses. Um, and again, we've um, you know, mentioned the decreased ability to perform adequate foot care and making sure that we talk about compensations that happen or that they may need to do in the foot care that we're asking them to do on a regular basis. And I, you know, as a physical therapist, when I'm going through and talking, it's not just, um, I will often ask them to demonstrate. So if they tell me um, they're doing foot care <laughs> on a regular basis, but yet we're still seeing signs of problems, when they come in, I'll just I'll ask them to tell me, show me how you do this every evening or you know once a week or however whatever frequency they say they're reporting it. So act like I'm not here in the room and I want to see how you go about you know checking your feet for um, problems. And if they kind of give you this, uh, what do I, <laughs> then that's a sign that maybe perhaps they really don't do that routinely. Um, or again, it can help you in figuring out difficulties or things they might be missing as part of the process. So in terms of ulcer characteristics, really evaluating ulcers, and this is something that I think um, a lot of people don't know, but physical therapists and part of our licensure exam really is on wound care. And it's still, um, unfortunately, it's a part of practice that has been slowly taken over by nurses in a lot of cases or wound care specialists. Um, but our um, national organization, we actually do have a wound care specialization 
um, that people can get. Um, and, and so, again, I'm just kind of informing you to know that this is an appropriate referral uh, for physical therapy if they do if, or if they need wound care, then um, you can refer to physical therapy for that. So, in terms of um, ulcer characteristics, obviously, larger and deeper wounds take longer to heal, um, and wounds that are present for a longer period of time also take longer to heal. Um, and so getting a history about their, uh, or getting the history about the, the um, how many pressure ulcers they've had, how long they've had them, and again, if they don't, um, they don't have good protective extension, they may not realize how long the sore has been there before somebody either called it to their attention or you yourself notified it. They would be like, I don't even, I didn't realize I had a wound. Um, and I know Dr. Latassi and I have come in and, you know, literally, people have said, you know, my toe really hurts, and they pull off their shoe, and it looks like this, and you go, oh, <laughs> clearly that's been around for some time. Um, so those are things that, and I mean, I've had situations before um, it, it, with people that I've worked with where it's like, I'm scared to touch it because I'm really, you know, it's so necrotic um, that you're really worried it's just going to fall off if you um, do anything with it, but... Um, so just be prepared for those sorts of surprises that you may um, get when you deal with individuals with um, diabetes, especially that are uncontrolled. So in terms of disease characteristics, um, you have for glycemic control, um, obviously that's associated with the increased risk of long-term complications. Um, the positive part of that is the complications can be um, improved or reversed with um, improved glycemic control. So that's the kind of cause effect um, that I think, and I know I've heard Dr. Britton talk to you all about really educating them about if you can get this under control, um, you know, these are the improvements that you can, you can see. But we really need to draw that connection for them. Um, just making an inference and telling them that they need to control their blood sugars without really explaining the, the secondary complications or the consequences of those, I think sometimes is where we fall short. Um, and so really taking the time so that they understand um, the potential ramifications of that and not leading it up to them to say, oh, this is why this is happening, but making that, uh, bridging that gap for them is important. Not that it's going to change all people, but um, it's part of what I feel like we should do. Um, the other thing that we have, um, and again, I think Good Shepherd's a good example of that, is um, inadequate care and education. Um, so many of the people that have diabetes may be underserved or impoverished and, and so they have lack of cutting edge knowledge about treatments that may be available. Um, even if they have that, if they're in rural areas, they may have lack of access to people that have the cutting edge knowledge in terms of treatments or things that we need to be doing. Um, you may also see a hesitancy or delayed referrals to other healthcare practitioners that can assist in the process. Um, you will see wide variation in terms of adherence to clinical guidelines, and we see this in physical therapy, as I'm sure you all will see. Uh, all professions have it, even though we have evidence out there um, that tells us these are the, the clinical guidelines we should be following. If you have practitioners that don't keep up with those levels of evidence or don't keep up on the latest information, then um, it really is putting the patient at risk. Um, they may have some minor short-term um, complications that are just compounded, especially um, those with less control um, into the long-term complications, which we've talked about. And then patients not understanding, again, and if I say it a million one time, I'm gonna say it a million, understanding the link between normal blood sugars and um, potential long-term complications that occur. So we just need to make sure that we draw that connection for them. Um, if they do have um, uh, sensory um, or neuropathy, lack, lack of sensation, so that absence of pain that they may not feel, um, or because they don't feel pain, then it really decreases their pain. And it's like, oh, I'm not feeling anything. I don't have anything to worry about. So their adherence does become a problem. Um, or if uh, part of the complications they have are just on the short term. Again, they may not realize the long-term consequences that um, can occur as a result. So in terms of PT tests and measures and what we do, um, some of these are going to be similar to what you as uh, PAs will do. Um, but they're going to be, when we um, get a referral, most oftentimes we're going to confirm those results 
um, as well as um, hopefully look into um, a little more depth, especially as it relates to um, gait analysis and um, different treatments that might um, we may be able to do to assist with that. So um, with circulation, um, obviously you're going to check pulses, and I think you all do this routinely. I've at least seen some of you um, at Good Shepherd as part of, um, again, just your overall physical exam with somebody that has diabetes to make sure that they have good pulses. Um, potentially having, now have you done Doppler ultrasounds yet? Okay. So that is, is that something they are going to do? They are in ER. They're going to do ABIs in, in ER module. Okay. So those will be things that you will eventually get um, or have access to and probably learn how to do. But those are also something that, again, as physical therapists, we will do to know if we need to refer on um, to another source. So in terms of um, indications of when we would do additional circulatory testing is obviously any open wound because um, we also want to look at are they getting good blood, blood flow to the wound um, to improve healing or to ensure that healing can occur. Um, if we have decreased or absent pulses, then those are going to be indications that we might want to do additional testing. Any signs and symptoms of arterial insufficiency, and again, what those signs and symptoms are going to be depends on the location. So obviously, if it's in the heart, it's going to be chest pain, shortness of breath that you'll be, maybe the complaints. If it's in the brain, they may complain, complain of dizziness, numbness, vision problems, which again, you have to sort out the vision problems from cataracts and all of those things from um, um, arterial insufficiency. And they also will have difficulty walking or talking. Um, in the legs or lower abdomen, they may come in with complaints of cramping, um, and that would be a sign, again, of arterial insufficiency. And then a history of per peripheral vascular disease that would be documented. Um, so in terms of circular um, circulation testing, again, you're going to do capillary refill. Um, indications would be if they have um, digital ulcer or on one of the digits of their, their toes. Um, you would look at that, or if they have an abnormal Doppler or ABI, um, you are often going to refer for an arterial, or as a physical therapist, we would um, refer to for an arteriogram uh, or transcutaneous oxygen measurements if they fail to respond, um, and obviously refer on to a vascular speci um, specialist if they have a, a very low ABI. So sensory integrity, this is, you all have learned the Symes Weinstein, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And why do you do that? Sensation. Sensation. Oh, it standardizes the pressure. Okay, standardizes the pressure. Good. And so, um, I, well, obviously it's on here for you, but what do the different levels tell you? What, what did we talk about earlier that this helps test for or helps discriminate? Okay, loss of sensation, but more specifically, protective sensation or a complete loss of sensation. So that's really kind of the marker that, that you're looking at here. And again, you do want to occlude the patient's vision when you're doing this so they can't cheat um, and see what you're doing. Um, begin with the, the 5.07 monofilament. Um, looking at, and I think what becomes difficult in individuals that have diabetes is they are prone to have callus formation. And so if you test over a calloused area, they're not going to feel it anyway. So you really do have to, even though we have our standard points that we need to look at, we have to try to work around if they do have callus formation that we're not hitting those calloused areas. Either that or you have to get rid of the calluses <laughs> prior to doing the testing. Um, and so, um, and again, each location being tested randomly three times. So why do we do this, or the indications for when we do it is when there are neuropathic ulcers. Obviously, all patients with diabetes, we should just routinely do this to see where they are, um, where their sensation is, and do they still have that protective sensation. And then any patient that has a plantar uh, foot, foot ulcer, we really need to check to make sure um, that they do still have um, good sensation, and if not, then we need to pull in some other mechanisms um, by which to make sure that they um, pay attention to those and then improve healing. So this is what this is just one example of what it looks like. These are the nine areas that um, we test for, and why are those 
nine areas chosen. Dermatomes. Okay, different dermatomes of the foot. Okay, and where do you, where are you most likely to see problems in individuals with diabetes? Okay, so plantar surface of the foot. Yeah, we still check the dorsum of the foot, but most often you're going to see problems in um, the plantar surface of the foot, which is why you have more spots there. And again, this is interpretation. So if um, we look at um, the monofilament 4.17, um, and again, the, the grams of pressure that are produced, you have decreased sensation. And if it's the 5.07, that was really why they say to start there, is because that's the, the indication of loss of protective sensation. Um, and then um, if they can't feel the 6.10 uh, monofilament, then that's when they have absolutely, they have no sensation whatsoever. And you need to be really concerned in, in those cases um, and take extra, extra precautions. So in terms of classification of neuropathic ulcers, so this is once a, um, a lesion has formed or you know, we're describing kind of skin integrity in this way, grade zero is that they have no open lesions. Um, they may have uh, deformity or cellulitis. And when I talked about those practice patterns, the integumentary practice pattern, A, um, which is at risk, or B, superficial skin involvement. Those are practice patterns specifically for PT that go to our guide to physical therapist practice. So you don't need to know those, um, but they're there because this is part of the slide set. Um, so grade one is a superficial um, um, ulcer. And again, you can either have a partial thickness or a full thickness ulcer. And then grades two through five um, are ones that we need to be very concerned about. So grade two would be a deep um, ulcer that goes down to the ten tendon, capsule, or bone. Um, a grade three is going to be a deep ulcer, but it's also going to include either some sort of abscess or um, infection, whether it be osteomyelitis or joint sepsis. Um, grade four is going to be your localized gangrene that's limited to one area. And then grade five is going to be gangrene that has um, encapsulated the entire foot. And oftentimes, like I said, if it's not caught then, then it's going to go up, you know, the, the leg and can end up in um, a below knee amputation quicker than you think. Um, so in terms of characteristics, um, as physical therapists that we would look at, and I'm sure you as uh, PAs as well, is what we call the 5PT method, which is pain, position, presentation, peri wound, which is the... Um, surface around the wound, looking at pulses, and looking at temperature, and how we describe those. So um, pain, what we often see, um, and again, this is something we typically um, are concerned about with people that have spinal cord injuries as well, when they have a loss of sensation, um, you don't feel pain. Um, and so you, you uh, below the level of lesion in the case of an individual with a spinal cord injury, and in the case of um, those with um, diabetes, again, because of the neuropathy, they don't typically have complaints of, complaints of pain. Whereas we, when we get a little even developing blister, we can say, ah, that hurts. <laughs> and we can, we often will present that. <coughs> Many times they, again, can have a foot that looks like this. They may or may not feel pain. And so it really depends on how intact their sensation is. So, and looking at possible paresthesias. Um, in terms of position, um, describing it, most often they're going to be on the plantar surface of the foot. But again, depending on footwear, sometimes you will get them. Um, and depending on foot deformities, um, you may actually see them on the dorsum of the foot, or that's where they start because of those deformities, because of rubbing um, on a shoe or you know a rock hits it and they don't realize that um, some sort of trauma has happened. So making sure you inspect all aspects of the foot, but position-wise, primarily going to be on the plantar aspect. Um, again, the plantar aspect of the metatarsal heads, because of just typical gait, we put a lot of pressure on our metatarsal heads. Um, and then um, in the case of deformity, like the Charcot um, deformity, it's going to be the medial aspect um, of the midfoot. Again, because the talus has um, basically collapsed and is sitting on the ground, you're going to have excessive pressure um, and see that on the medial aspect. Um, it may occur, and I talked about this, a lot of times they will have callus formation that may actually be masking an underlying wound. 
And so that's why keeping calluses, calluses trimmed <laughs> is important so that they don't um, develop an underlying um, neuropathic ulcer. And as we've talked about, it may occur in areas where there's pressure or, uh, pressure or friction because of inappropriate footwear, which again, um, because of the lack of sensation, they're not going to be able to feel that. Um, and so they may go for longer periods of time without noticing it. Um, and then by the time they take their shoes off, the sore is already there. Uh, presentation, you will often hear them referred to, and I think one of these have good examples. So they'll be round, kind of punched out. It looks like you've just taken a whole punch and, you know, um, taken a layer or two of skin off. Um, and that's the common presentation of um, neuropathic ulcers in those with um, diabetes. And this one doesn't as... Oftentimes, the kind of the peri wound will be calloused around the edges, so keeping that callus formation um, trimmed back is important so that you can get um, oxygen <laughs> to the remaining tissues um, is important. It really, they, they often don't smell um, because unless they become infected, and the same thing, you won't often see drainage from them. So it's atypical from pressure ulcers that um, develop for individuals that utilize wheelchairs or again have spinal cord injuries for lots of other reasons um, where you may very quickly develop <laughs> um, drainage and all sorts of things even when they're not infected you don't see that oftentimes um, with people with diabetes unless it does become infected. Um, eschar or necrotic tissue so that's when it's died off it really is becomes more like a scab that really that's what eschar is is kind of a scab but again the underlying part of that is um, the healing tissue um, and again unless it's infected we don't see a lot of that um, and usually if there is then that's a sign that infection is developing and um, we need to be cautious and get that tissue removed so that um, kind of the grain or tissue can be exposed again to oxygen and hopefully adequate blood flow to uh, ensure proper healing. So para wound and structural changes that we see, uh, we talked about the skin is dry often, so making sure that they use um, a good moisturizer um, to prevent drying and cracking of the skin uh, becomes increasingly important. Um, often calluses are uh, present and you will see all sorts of structural deformities. These are common ones. Um, claw toes, um, rock or bottom foot, which I have some uh, pictures of, and then a prior amputation. And just making note of all of those things because um, they're going to change, number one, where the pressures are on their foot, both in standing and during ambulation, um, and it will change the gait mechanics. Um, obviously, if they've had a prior amputation, that in and of itself, um, especially if they don't have a, a prosthetic um, that they're using consistently, then their gait is likely going to be changed as a result of that. So claw toes, um, the picture is on your left, um, and you can see the, um, basically I look at, the, you know, your top, um, toes are clawed, if you will, into the ground, and then one of the common things is you see basically their toenails are pointing downward, or, and sometimes they're even wrapped under their feet, um, and so you look at that, um, that's an indication then of um, problems that they see. Now where would you expect um, this individual um, to have difficulty with pressure, potential callus formation? Yeah, at the top of the, yeah, on the, top of the, the um, interphalangeal joint that they're going to see. They're also probably on the tips of their toes because they're actually digging into the ground may see where you see pressure there. So you're going to pay attention. You can actually see, I can't do it, um, or I can't run here. No, it doesn't work in here. Okay. <laughs> doesn't work on the TV screens. Anyway, on the tops you can see where it already looks like some callus formation has started um, occurring. And then on the right hand picture, that's what a rocker bottom foot looks like. So basically it's the collapse of the medial arches. So it really is, instead of you know it being an arch, it's kind of a reverse arch, an arc. <laughs> um, and so again, if you could just imagine um, kind of where the pressures are going to be um, in that case. Um, and it's going to be primarily on, and this is, it was this one. So you have, again, the chance of excessive pressure that occurs because that now, and again, that's because of the collapse of the talus, is now going to be a weight-bearing surface, which it's not designed to be. 
um, and so you have excessive pressure that occurs. Um, and the, oftentimes the, this will occur first and then you begin getting, if you remember that picture from earlier, you get, begin getting that medial collapse. So it'll drop first, which is what the talus does. So it'll drop down, that's when you get the rocker bottom, and then it'll shift medially. Um, and so you get the more exaggerated uh, medial collapse of the foot. Um, so in terms of pulses, again, they may be normal or um, because of vessel calcification, um, you may have um, or sense decreased pulses in um, the, the ankle. And so we need to pay attention to that. Temperature, um, again, you often, you may see normal temperatures or if they have some sort of infection, you may, um, you know, feel one side. Um, and you can see this, you know, feel one side that's hotter or more warm than the other because of that um, reactive blood flow that's coming in to help try to fight the infection. Um, so this is just an example or a picture um, that shows the patient with a uh, plantar uh, first metatarsal wound. And again, you kind of see that punched out. Um, it's not very deep, which is good. Um, and so something that hopefully um, we can treat and uh, it looks like it has been treated some sort of moisturizer probably around the white you can see that white around the edges that most likely is going to be eventual callus formation so making sure that that's um, continued to be moisturized um, and trimmed so that um, healing can occur um, this is one where um, and again every time I look at this I have to get my orientation that what you're actually seeing is the you can see a Charcot deformity so the on the, be, I can look at it this way. On your right, that's the medial side of the person's foot. So the great toe has been amputated. Every time I look at it, I think, oh, that's the great, no, that's the little toe on the other side. So you can see basically amputations of the um, great toe, the second, third, and fourth um, phalanges, basically toes, still has the, the fifth toe. Uh, but lots of uh, you know tissue you can see um, scar tissue or uh, callus formation around that so you don't see really red granular tissue which is a sign of healing um, and so in terms of a physical therapist if this person were to come to me we'd be getting rid of or trim that callus formation because we want to see a brighter red um, that looks like good granular that's in the center of that is a little bit of S, what I would call escar forming. And so again, that's something that we want to get rid of so that the good um, tissue can um, develop as part of that. Um, and you can see um, where the kind of looks like a bruised area and previous callus formation is actually part of a Charcot deformity. Um, so you've got increased weight bearing likely on that side. And so this is what, after debridement has occurred, you can see it's nice and shinier, and you can see the red granular tissue now in the center of it, which is what we want to see. Um, and probably just gradually over time, they'll trim more and more of that callus formation to expose um, the red granular tissue that is underneath. So in terms of prognosis, um, these are indications of when you're likely to see good healing versus poor healing. Um, so if you have a smaller um, superficial wound of grade one or two, if it's present for less than two months, or if you have ulcers that decrease, actually you can measure decrease in size within four weeks of um, treatment, then those are signs of good healing and good prognosis. If you have um, a larger size, um, the risk of amputation becomes basically 154 times greater within an infected ulcer. So we want to try to do everything to prevent infections because once an infection occurs with somebody with diabetes, it almost always results in um, amputation. And then um, if you, know, you see a 20 to 50% decrease in size is not noted within um, the first month of treatment, then again, they're going to be at, um, have a poor prognosis for ultimate healing. Um, now, with anything that we see in healthcare, there's large variability in healing rates. A lot of that is tied specifically to um, their um, glucose control. So, 
uh, you know, the more controlled they can be within it, then the likely they are. And even those who are well controlled, they are not going to heal the same as you and I. So where it might take six to eight weeks for us to heal, there's going to be on average of 12 to 14 weeks. And you see this with uh, fractures, you see this with ulcers, all sorts of things. Their healing time is going to be, um, you know, uh, probably four weeks to eight weeks longer than what is typical um, with the rest of the population. Okay, um, I have a few more slides. I don't know if you want to just power through and be done as early as possible. Yes, okay, that is, <laughs> that is consensus, I believe. Anybody object to that? Okay. All right, then I'm not going to argue with you either. Okay, so the other thing that as we as physical therapists do is gait. Um, and I know last year when I presented on gait, I don't think, um, I know um, Dr. Latassi asked, said, well, can you demonstrate? And I wasn't ready. So I've added that this year just to look at um, kind of the normal gait cycle. Um, and this is about a three minute video um, that talks about um, the gait cycle. Just gait simply means the world. So we'll watch it. And then gait analysis is analyzing the world and works to see if there's anything wrong with them. You make gait analysis easy. We only look at one leg. Can you all hear that? Mm -hmm. Hold this, the reference leg, which I've colored here in red. In stage steps or seconds, we measure time in terms of the gait cycle, which is a complete stride with the reference leg. Measured from one heel strap, then the foot first touches the ground, and the next time the foot hits the ground. For a successful gait cycle, the reference leg must do three things, which we call gait tasks. First, is weight acceptance, meaning the leg can't collapse when you first stand on it. The second is single leg support, meaning the leg must hold you up while your momentum is coming forward. The last is limb and weight. The leg must swing forward and get ready to start the cycle again. The gait cycle is separated into two main sections. Stance is when the reference limb is on the ground, and this takes up about 60% of the gait cycle. Swing is the remaining 40% of the gait cycle, when the reference limb is in the air. Stance can be further separated into phases. Initial contact is the first 2% of the gait cycle, until we reach double zero, which is when both limbs are supporting the body weight. Next is the loading response, which covers 10% of the cycle, until the point of contralateral toe off, which is when the upper leg is no longer on the ground. The next 19% of the gait cycle is in stance, which makes sense since it is in the middle of the stance. There is the terminal stance phase for another 19% of the gait cycle. After there is contralateral contact, meaning the other foot has touched the ground, free swing is when the reference limb pushes off the ground. This phase covers 12% of the cycle. Swing can be separated into three phases. Initial swing, which is the first 13%, until we reach maximum knee flexion, in other words, the grace and knee bend. Mid swing is 12%, from then until the lower leg is vertical. Terminal swings, the remaining 13% of the cycle, until the next contact, and the cycle goes again. By analyzing the bed cycle, we can measure things like walking speed, stuff like cadence, symmetry, stability, and the angles at the hip, knee, and ankle joints. These are all helpful indicators that our patient is healthy and functioning well physiologically. In doing gait analysis, we might also notice symptoms like contralateral drop, where the opposite side of the hip drops during the loading response. Or we might notice hiking, where the reference side of the hip lifts to help the leg swing forward. A sideways lean or lateral lean, as well as forwards lean and backwards lean, will also become obvious when we do gait analysis. If you found this video helpful and you'd like to see more like it, leave a suggestion in the comments below. Okay, so just to review, make sure you got it. So we have two phases of the gait cycle, the stance phase and the swing phase. Stance is 60% of the cycle, swing is 20% of the cycle. And I, you know, one of the things that I always like doing, and I think it would be a good habit for really any healthcare practitioner, is as they walk, I mean, watching them walk into the treatment rooms, or as they're leaving, watching them walk out to see, 
um, kind of do you, you see symmetry on both sides? Do you see one side that is doing something a little different than the other side? Not that you have to you know figure out what it is, but that just gives you some indications of what might be going on. So what we see in what we call a neuropathic gait, which is what is common um, with individuals with diabetes, is this is a gate is going to be that of a neuropathic gait in which the distal lower extremity is affected. For this particular gait, the, uh, the person has an inability to dorsiflex the foot, and so the foot is actually a foot drop, and the person must step high in order to clear the foot. So if I don't step high enough, I'm going to drag the toe, the shoe, and so what um, happens is the person steps high to be able to clear the foot as the foot drags or as the foot drop position. You can kind of hear that foot slap. Okay, that's again an indication of problems that you will see. And if you think about, I always think of the neuropathic gait as if you, if your legs go to sleep, you know, and you're getting up and you try to walk, you kind of do this exaggerated <laughs> step because you want to make sure you're not, you know, dragging your foot across that. So that really is what people with diabetes, <laughs> maybe we'll shut this down, what, what they are dealing with. Forty-three. Thank you. Gosh. Okay. Um, so that really is what they're dealing with. Now, again, you co uh, combine that with lack of range of motion. So dorsiflexion is the the major problem that they have, which then causes the foot to be in a, in a plantar flex state. And again, so that's why they have to usually um, increase hip and knee flexion to actually clear the foot off the ground. So those are things that you can look for as part of your um, physical exam. Again, it doesn't take long. You can watch it and see. Um, again, notice differences in symmetry between sides. Um, if they do have some, if they still have protective sensation, um, and they may be feeling something that's wrong, like if they do have a pressure sore or a uh, ulcer on one side, they may not want to wait there as quickly, so they'll do a quick um, stance phase of gait on that side where the pressure ulcer is, and that gives you an indication that they're just trying to get off that foot quickly and onto the other foot to, um, as a protective mechanism. Um, so in terms of our uh, PT interventions, again, um, we like to use a team approach, some of us anyway, uh, where we do have obviously primary care providers that you are uh, a part of that will make referrals um, to us, looking at surgeons when we, uh, whether it be because of um, musculoskeletal deviations that occur um, or surgical treatments um, that deal with the, the ulcers that develop ultimately and then or potential amputations that occur. Um, being kind of in cahoots with them, um, often looking at podiatrists as, as we're looking at more customized footwear to try to prevent um, ulcer development, um, nutritious and diabetic educators um, to make sure that they understand a good food intake and what is going to help in, in terms of control of their diabetes. Um, endocrinologists, orthotists, and again, psychological counselor, social worker, there's multiple people that can be involved and I think the more people um, that are involved, probably the better to make sure that we have all areas covered. So in terms of things that uh, physical therapists tend to do um, as part of the um, treatment process is patient or client related instruction. Um, so we do talk about uh, d disease process and the management. Um, we will reinforce what you as primary care providers are saying in terms of control um, of their um, blood glucose levels. Um, really talking with them and explaining the role of exercise and safety guidelines. Um, most often people with diabetes can often become very deconditioned. Um, and so exercise to them may just be walking across the room or walking to the mailbox um, initially. And so really talking about, and that's why I put exercise because I think people have a uh, perception of what exercise means and for some of these people it's just any physical activity may be exercise initially depending on how 
um, deconditioned they are. So um, just encouraging consistent physical activity as opposed to exercise, because again, some people have a negative connotation of what that means. Uh, but if we can promote uh, physical activity just as a routine part of their day, then maybe we can actually get to the point of cardiovascular exercise, uh, which will be part of the process. Um, looking and telling them, explaining the potential risk of exercise based on um, their presentation as well as any contraindications. If their blood sugar is way too high or way too low or, you know, that that's not a time that they want to go about exercising. If they have a, a, an ulcer, um, then again, we're either going to have to give them exercises that's not going to exacerbate their problem or look at modifying activities where they can do some sort of exercise um, that doesn't um, end up doing more harm than good. And uh, providing general guidelines about what to do both before exercise, um, during exercise, and after exercise. And part of that is monitoring their blood sugars. Part of it has to do with snacks that they may or may not have. It talks to, um, has to do with hydration and making sure they still stay well hydrated um, as part of the process of so just giving them those general guidelines. Um, talking about risk factor reduction and being that physical activity and exercise is part of their risk factor reduction. So if they can incorporate that um, on a routine basis, then again, they're going to be better off. Um, the daily foot checks and the foot care guidelines, which again, I gave you two handouts about. One's just a one page and one with a booklet and making sure they have those um, available for them. Asking them to demonstrate to you um, what their foot care or their daily foot checks look like. So again, you can get an idea of, is this something they really do or is this something they're just telling me because they know they're supposed to be doing it, but they don't. Um, again, I pay a lot of attention to proper footwear and making sure that um, they have that and giving them resources again for people with diabetes. They have lots if they have Medicare as funding There's lots of um, access that they may have to get uh, specialized shoes that will help um, diabetic shoes that will help uh, within their um, Process if they don't have insurance and again looking at community resources that may, might be available um, to assist with providing uh, proper foot care Toenail care, um, and again, making sure that they have guidelines about that and um, that they can actually um, go seek support or help um, if they themselves can't take care of that. Uh, if they still have um, some sensation, then beginning to, for you know, kind of projecting for the future of what decreased protective ex or keep saying extension, which is in children. <laughs> The um, decreased protective sensation feels like, um, and so it can be things like, uh, again, you can give the example of when their their feet fall asleep, what does that feel like, and kind of some of the changes that it is. It's also giving them mechanisms that they can use that if they do have lack of sensation, making sure that in areas that they do have sensation, so telling them to check the bath water with their arm versus their feet. Um, and they build in those checks and balances ahead of time so that they don't put themselves at risk um, for additional problems. Um, so um, one of the things for physical therapy interventions, um, because they are precautions that we have because they may not show signs of infection, um, because of they, if they have peripheral vascular disease, um, they may have a decreased inflammatory response, so oftentimes we will request cultures or sensitivity for wounds that fail to respond just to make sure there's not underlying infection that we're not aware of. Um, if they do have osteomyelitis, obviously that needs to be treated surgically, and so that would be, in our case, a referral back to a primary care physician for additional testing um, to see if that is the case. Other precautions that we're going to tell them to do and we're going to do as part of a routine part of our interventions is making sure that they monitor their blood sugar. And again, we will oftentimes ask them to do that as part of our um, interventions because you may see, you know, in some cases it may be a hyperglycemic episode or a hypoglycemic episode that can occur um, as part of that. So that is something that we will routinely do as part of our interventions and incorporate that. Um, so they get in the habit of routinely doing it if they're going to carry out a program um, in their home environment. In terms of keys to local wound care, uh, if we're um, looking at that is we need to offload um, the neuropathic ulcer or try to take some of the, the weight bearing off of that. Um, so we're going to pair or trim the callus uh, flush with the epithelial surface. 
um, so that it doesn't get built up and again oxygen can get to it. Um, encourage the use of a petroleum-based moisturizer um, and there's all sorts of different lotions on the market these days. That's the biggest thing is just making sure they keep their feet um, moisturized. Um, if they do um, have um, you know deformities of their toes or you know different types then we may use some type of toe spacer or additional padding um, to make sure that um, they they can get uh, we can support uh, more normal alignment and decrease the pressures on um, the deformed foot um, if we have or if we're not getting you know enough with just debridement and overall either medication management or uh, wound management then obviously adjuncts are going to be um, negative pressure wound therapy ultrasound electrical stimulation growth factors are all things that um, we would potentially look as possible adjuncts to um, treating a wound <clears throat> um, some physical therapists that um, do wound care a lot, um, are actually trained in doing um, contact casting, um, so which is a modified uh, short leg cast for uh, Wagner ulcers grade one and two. And we had a, a, actually a young lady that I worked with for many years that actually had spina bifida but was at extreme risk for neuropathic ulcer development. She actually developed them on the dorsum of her foot and almost every time um, she was in a cast and that was the only way we could get her uh, wounds to heal if we just left them you know we did debridement those sorts of things they never healed she was almost always required total contact casting um, and so basically it's um, a cast is molded to the foot and leg that helps um, disperse the weight bearing forces over a large area um, it obviously the cast rigidity controls edema and one of the contraindications if they do have fluctuating edema it's not something that's good to do it, in fact they tell you not to um, and again the immobilization of the foot protects it from um, trauma and microorganisms and obviously if it's cast they can't take it off so it assists with patient adherence um, co contraindications for the total contact cast osteomyelitis gangrene again fluctuating edema um, active infection or um, ABI less than 0.45 because again they're just um, too at risk for other complications. So this is just an example of what a total contact cast kind of the process would look like um, and then the walking boot that would go along with it that they can, they can actually walk. The young lady that I worked with used a wheelchair so she didn't, we didn't have that complicating factor. Um, so gait and mobility training, uh, part of what we will do is look at uh, potentially using some sort of assistive device um, to help offload, if you will, that the plantar surface of the foot. So as they are progressing, which you will see in this video, hopefully. So you can see here she's actually using, and this is the, the foot that is uh, has the beginnings um, and actually a pretty rapid um, Charcot and you can see pressure um, or uh, wound management there so actually using the walker as she um, goes to help um, decrease the weight bearing on that medial surface of the um, right foot so you will that is an example of one and then um, we will often, uh, or we may suggest that they alter their gait pattern um, to a step two pattern. And this is not a great video, but it will give you an idea. Um, Modified two point gait. So, what they're. <laughs> so, instead of stepping through, it's just bringing the other foot up into the next one. So, they're, um, again, they don't have as much weight bearing on this side. Um, and so that's something that we may, depending on um, what the person is doing, uh, and if we want to offload the pressures, then we will train them in that sort of gait. Obviously, taking slower steps uh, and more methodical steps is another strategy that we may use. Um, and a shuffling gait, although um, I don't recommend this very frequently unless they do have some sort of sensation because it can actually create more, more uh, pressure. But you will see, and this is actually a person with Parkinson's, but I just want you to see what a shuffling gait will look like. Um, so they take tiny little steps. Um, oh, that was really short. Um, let me go back. 
that go back and forth. So um, again, that may be something that it's really just smaller steps, shorter steps, that they don't have to weight bear so much um, across that we may do. And obviously looking at footwear modifications, which we've talked about. Um, so if they do have range of motion um, limitations, then we will assess and address, again, great toe extension. Um, which you don't think your great toe plays that big of a deal, but again, the gait cycle, it's a huge because it's necessary for push off. Um, and so really looking at that and making sure, um, you know, trying to increase that if they have the ability to and really looking at uh, the force production that they have as part of that so that they can actually get um, the, the uh, movement necessary to actually clear their foot through the gait cycle. Um, so ankle dorsiflexion or tail, uh, the talus um, calcaneus, that joint, um, really looking at that as well as subtalar um, joint motion. And so we may do, if there's some limitations in it, but they still have good alignment, um, we feel like we can get that range back. That's where joint mobilization sometimes will come in that we will do um, to try to increase the mobility that they have in their foot. Um, we will um, assist with aerobic exercise, um, again, partly for glycemic control. Um, if they are somebody who also has uh, problems with being overweight, then it also can assist with weight loss. And that will probably, as we've talked about, depending on their comorbidities, um, be kind of a gradual thing um, in terms of what aerobic exercise is for that individual person and how deconditioned they are. So in terms of devices and equipment, um, looking at temporary footwear, and that may be at, as they're in a different stage of um, kind of pressure ulcer um, healing. So we can look at foam or felt um, inserts. We could look at padded ankle foot orthoses or different types of walking shoes that they, uh, they would use um, until we can get the wound um, actually healed. Um, obviously, it provides for safe ambula ambulation, uh, pressure reduction, and allows room for bandages, but we know that's not going to be their ultimate where we hope they will be. Um, and then they can use uh, when total contact cast is not an option. In terms of permanent footwear, um, making sure that the shoes are one half inch longer than the longest toe. And that's <laughs> sometimes what, so their toes aren't, you know, rubbing up against um, the edge of, of the foot. Um, and sometimes, uh, you know, if you don't have adequate or uh, size shoes, then that's where it can contribute in and of itself to those toe claw deformities or hammer toe deformities, all of those, because your shoes are too, um, not, they don't fit appropriately. Um, obviously, the shoe um, should match the foot shape. Um, which again, if it's a really deformed foot, that's when we need to look at some sort of uh, referral to an orthotist or uh, a podiatrist to look at some sort of orthopedic shoe that could accommodate deformities if they do have those and if they're not correctable. Um, extra depth toe box. Um, New Balance are probably the best shoes I know of that have a wider toe box, which is you know the distal end of the shoe. Um, and it, if they use any sort of orthotic on top of that, I almost always recommend them as the shoe of choice because, again, they're just wider and they tend to accommodate um, the um, orthotics better than um, traditional shoes. And then heel height, obviously we want to offload the metatarsal pressure, so having anything more than an inch um, in terms of heel um, increases the pressure that you put on the metatarsal heads, which just puts them at greater risk. So uh, permanent footwear, we want to go for soft moldable materials, not too soft, <laughs> you know, that just collapse with pressure. So, um, you know, soft is rel a relative term. We may use some sort of soft insert. And again, I think some of you have seen me, uh, not necessarily for people with diabetes, but people that complain of foot pain in general, looking at some sort of shoe insert to make sure they have a good arch support um, within their shoes. Um, I always tell people to fit the shoes in the middle of the day, especially if they have edema problems, because in the, at the first of the day, they may lace them up and they're gonna fit you know, really snug, but then as edema starts you know, throughout the day, then it could cause. Um, so middle of the day is a good time, kind of a baseline to, to look at fitting the shoe. 
Um, I always warn them to not get a new pair of shoes and wear them all day, every day for now and to really break them in gradually. If they have, um, again, lack of sensation and they have lost protective, I will give them a more specific wearing <coughs> schedule, like wear them 10 minutes at a time. If you take them off, there's no problems, then you can put them back on. Uh, but probably never wear them more than an hour. And again, just break them in gradually based on um, their response to their foot to that, to that. As we talked about, patients with severe foot deformities or amputations um, need to be referred to an orthotist or a podiatrist to look at. Um, making sure we accommodate those uh, foot deformities and they have appropriate footwear. Um, medical and surgical interventions, um, you know, uh, you all know about glycemic control um, and the associations that you see. Obviously, if you have um, a decrease in the <coughs> hemoglobin A1C, and you'll see um, improvements in many of the complications. Um, we can manage um, neuropathic pain and paresthesias with lots of different medications and creams, looking at management of arterial insufficiency um, that um, are prob often problematic in individuals that have diabetes. If they have some sort of um, infection, then making sure that we have the, the appropriate type of antibiotic, antibiotic therapy, depending on how their cultures come out, um, if they, especially if they have um, you know, obviously an infection that has developed. And then uh, we may do some sort of um, radiologic assessment for fracture identification um, that can occur, especially if there's um, uh, Charcot um, deformities of the foot, any presence of uh, foreign bodies that might occur, because again, if they have lactic protective, they're not gonna feel that, whereas we might feel a bone spur, they're not going to. Um, and so sometimes just to rule those out as a complicating factor to the ulcers if they've developed. And then obviously we're going to do in some sort of bone scan if there is a risk or if we suspect osteomyelitis. Um, if uh, local wound treatment has not um, helped in wound uh, management or um, healing, then we would look at surgical um, debridement of the necrotic tissue or in the case of osteomyelitis, um, again, incision and drainage um, that may occur if an infection has developed and um, antimicrobial bead implantation, which there's a picture of, of an ulcer of the fourth digit, after it's gone, after the person went through um, surgical debridement, and then they put the implantation of the antimicrobial beads to assist with the healing process. Other um, surgical interventions that um, people with diabetes may have is um, surgery that addresses the abnormal function, uh, foot function or limited tissue uh, perfusion. Um, sometimes they will go in if you have a Charcot deformity that becomes so unstable and they'll do a joint arthroplasty, which is basically uh, stabilizing the joint um, and fixing it. Uh, which then can cause other problems down the line, but and is usually a last resort. Um, because of the deformities that occur, you may have shortening of a tendon on one side or the other, and so they may need some sort of tendon lengthening, especially uh, because of plantar flexion contractures. Um, if, we, if we can't get uh, the increased range of motion through, um, you know, kind of physical interventions, then we may need to look at some sort of tendon lengthening. Um, and a stabilization, stabilization of the Charcot deformities um, to reduce the abnormal biomechanics and get them back to a more normal gait pattern. Um, depending on their um, um, vascularization, they may have to have some sort of you know, uh, graft surgery to assist with the vascularization to the area, and then ultimately um, what we try to avoid, which is that of amputation when there is gangrene or Wagner grade four or five ulcers that occur. So that's what I have. Any questions? I did get you out. Oh, wait. <laughs> when we refer a patient to you for wound care, foot care, how do you guys either need or want the, the set of orders that those should be written for you to do what you need to do? PT evaluate and treat. Yeah. <laughs> and you can say PT evaluate and treat for wound healing, or I mean, you can say something like that, but the more broad you make it for us, the better it is. Yeah. If it's too prescriptive, 
Um, even though we can do an individualized treatment plan, if it says, you know, one time a week or three times a week or whatever, then we're limited by that. And oftentimes, even though our treatment plan may be different, we're going to have to come back to you to say either this supersedes the previous orders that we've written and we concur with the treatment plan developed by the physical therapist, whereas if it's evaluate and treat, then they go with our treatment plan.